luck and welcome to Close Up. I hope you are listening and following all the advisories from all the relevant authorities. On the show tonight, we will talk about the impacts of COVID-19 on the most vulnerable, particularly the women. And to enlighten us with this discussion, I have invited the coordinator of the Fiji Women Crisis Center, Shamima Ali, on the show tonight. Welcome to the show, Shamima. Thank you and good evening. Good evening. How, first of all, how have you been so far? I've been good, you know, missing the interaction with staff and people a lot, but uh, trying to keep safe and healthy as much as possible. Now, I understand that the work that you do requires face-to-face uh, -face interaction and to some extent. Now, with the government across the world, not just ours, uh, discouraging face-to-face -face interactions, how have you been able to coordinate your work around these restrictions? Yes, it is quite difficult and challenging, but because the Crisis Centre is quite an old organisation, over 35 years of experience, and we've gone through a lot of crises in this country, political and natural disasters and so on. So we've always uh, you know, planned and strategised and have been ready for anything, though COVID-19 is quite different from any other crisis. So we were very quick to start organising ourselves from February, from the end of January actually, you know, uh, stopping all travel, um, uh, deferring all workshops, community work and things like that, but also the counselling which is the core business of the crisis centre. So the counsellors are very well trained, the counsellor advocates, so we realise that we'll have to do a lot of things using technology like phones, Facebook, uh, Zoom, uh, emails and so on. And we really also realised that we had to ensure that all the referral agencies that we use, like police and all, were uh, you know, aware of what we were doing and that they were also working as well. So uh, the way that we are working now is through counselling 24-7. We've got about uh, 22 counsellors throughout Fiji who are on 24-7 call. Uh, and this, the numbers have been advertised quite widely. And of course, we also run the government's 1560 line, the toll-free line. So we've got three people dedicated uh, totally to that. So all in all, about 25 lines going. And, uh, and the 1560, of course, is toll-free from any network. So yeah, so that's how we are doing at the moment. We're getting the calls. We're doing counseling on the phone. It, uh, the phone counseling used to be a very small percentage of our counseling. But now it is the way to counsel now so you know and then face to face also runs the risk for survivors it runs the risk for the workers so it's by phone and then we use the referral services there's an emergency the police the health services and if there's a need to do referral to other um, uh, NGOs like Empower Pacific Lifeline we are also able to do that and being part of a wider group led by the Ministry for Women of uh, a referral pathway, you know, using the, um, uh, the service delivery protocol and so on, yeah. So, and then also, you know, using the courts, we have got lawyers, um, uh, we've got a legal team of five, and uh, they're also doing a lot of works, and they have started going out to the courts also. Now, uh, what are some challenges that you and your team encounter while carrying out your responsibilities, and how did you manage to work your way around them? Yes, there are some difficulties, you know, um, especially we are very used to face-to-face -face counselling. The counsellors are very much used to that because, you know, in holistically doing counselling work, you also look at body language, what the survivor is not saying and, you know, and the facial expressions and all that. So that very much is part of the counselling work. So there is a lot of difficulty there. You're not able to gauge, but sometimes with the voice one can. So that face to face, the personal individual advocacy that our counsellors do, you know, accompanying to the police station, to the hospital, to social welfare, um, you know, to to look for housing and accompanying them to shelters and continuing with ongoing counseling. So they're missing a lot of that. Uh, though we have recently, because we've acquired some PPEs and uh, like masks and things, and they really want to go out. So we have started with children. We're getting some cases of uh, child molestation from the neighborhood and things like that. So uh, we, they have started that and we'll do more of that as uh, you, you know, as, as, uh, as we um, 
uh, uh, go on. And then we have got also their challenges because of uh, sometimes the referral agencies don't respond just as quickly and urgently as we would like them to or don't respond at all. So while the police is working very well in the Suva area and they've been tremendously helpful in uh, you know uh, attending to cases immediately, the actual domestic violence when it's happening, removing the survivor, taking her through medical, dropping her off to her mother's place or something like that, some of them. We're still having problems, particularly in the Western Division and some other far-flung police stations. So we're, you know, working through all of that. We're having some problems with challenges with legal aid, you know, the availability, the response time and all those things. So, you know, those challenges will be there, but we are working through the COVID, SDP COVID-19 work group with government and other agencies to put those things right. Now, uh, can you uh, briefly tell us about the refer referral agencies that, that has been set up for uh, where the Fiji Women Crisis Centre is a part of? Yes, this is actually led by the Ministry for Women and uh, part and we have got a group of like Empower Pacific, um, um, uh, MSP, Medical Services Pacific, uh, Salvation Army, those NGOs, Homes of Hope and so on, as well as government agencies like police, health, uh, the judiciary and others, education and all these people and UN agencies, especially particularly UN Women, which is providing a lot of technical assistance here. And uh, the Minister for Women is very much leading this and she's aware of it and she's really and very encouraging. So this is the group that is working and there is a core working group made up of Women's Crisis Center, UN Women and the Ministry of uh, Women. So, you know, producing um, uh, online training material with UN Women taking the lead on that. Uh, we should be able to provide online training for frontline responders and uh, all those things and also resource kit for, uh, for responders um, and advertising the numbers and producing IEC material. So, you know, that's working well and the referrals are working well also. We have, uh, uh, in, uh, you know, as I said before, when it doesn't work, this is the group we go back to. Now, uh, tell us about the 12 free lines and the lines that people can actually call you on if they need the assistance that the centre provides. Okay. Well, the government toll-free line, of course, is the 1560. Uh, that is, we are contracted by government to run that one, 24-7. And then we've got our own lines like 3333 uh, and 9209-470. And so, you know, so these are the lines that people can. And then we've got them all advertised. You'll find that on our Facebook if you can, but also via radio and so on. There are about 22 numbers that one can call. Stay with us. We'll hear more from Shumima Ali after the break. Welcome back to the show. Now, for those of you who just recently joined us, I'm here on the set with um, Shamima Ali, and we've been discussing on the challenges and what Fiji Women Crisis Center is doing to address these challenges because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Now, uh, we were talking about the 12 free lines and the lines that people can call to reach out to the center. Now, can you please briefly describe the need uh, that these callers require and how, ma how many of these calls have you received so far? So if you look at from uh, the calls that we had from January, these are all the crisis center lines, the people who have come in, not just the calls, but people who have come in with January was still open. So we had about 1,100, about 1,173 people who came in or called and uh, until April 24th. But just for um, from the 1st to the 24th of April, we have had uh, 400 and, uh, 400, 758, uh, sorry, 415 new people who are calling. So that's quite a lot just for the month, for one month, for one month yeah. And this is where we are seeing the spike of, of this. And that's about, and uh, of the 1,173, about 894 or 76% of calls are domestic violence related, whether they are first timers or repeated domestic violence related and also um, ch a smaller percentage of child abuse, of rape, attempted rape. And of course, when we talk about domestic violence, it's also marital rape, rape within marriage and so on. And then we've also got uh, now, and in 1560, we have received close to from 1st April to now the toll free line, we've received up over 500 calls on that one alone. Half of that also is from men. Uh, so it's a toll free line, so people are calling. So men are also calling, they're also going through, uh, you know, stuff, they're, uh, you know, lost their jobs or they have uh, 
you know, just uh, can't feed the family, they're getting frustrated, they're stuck at home, which usually men are not. They socialize a lot more, so it's where, and the children are at home. And so, so some frustrations. Um, women are also reporting a lot of emotional abuse, overburdened with work, because now 24-7 the kids are at home, the husbands are at home. And then some of them have got extended families that they also take care of because women also are caregivers and so on and women have lost their jobs and things like that um you know uh, men demanding money uh, for grog and for alcohol and for and in in a few cases for drugs and things like that so and and when women don't give it there is you know violence there is swearing there is a lot of abuse and things like that so these are the kind of calls that we are we are getting um and of course some people are wanting to go for testing, but they don't know what to do, they're a bit scared. So all the frontline responders, the crisis center included, we have had some quick training on, on and we listen to what we can tell them immediately and then we refer them to the toll-free 158 line and so on. Yeah, so the, all those, ref, uh, and, and the command centers, the police command centers, if people want to go there. We're also getting, um, uh, you know, calls from uh, uh, parents or mothers who's, um, juvenile kids have been arrested uh, over the curfew breaking uh, over curfew breaches so we're also trying to uh, lawyers are attending to the minors and ensuring that they get bail and things like that you know so mm -hmm. it's a whole range of things and uh, because people are in a desperate situation this is something like we've never had before people are in a desperate situation they they access whatever lines are available and i believe also that there's a lot of credibility in the fiji women's crisis center that we will do something about it so i think that's why we're getting a lot more calls now uh You've talked about a lot of issues that many of these callers are calling you for. Has there been a need for physical interaction in any of these cases so far? Yes, definitely. And we have done that. Uh, so we have attended to uh, uh, providing supplies for our survivors who need the supplies, food supplies, food for the babies, um, and uh, you know, things like kerosene, kerosene stoves and things. We've also um, uh, responded to people struck by uh, survivors of the hurricane, of the cyclone Herald. And uh, so we've been able to, you know, our drivers who are on call, we are also part of essential services, some of our counselors and drivers. So they have managed to take uh, uh, food supplies and things to in evacuation centers in Tailevu and the villages who have gone back and have not. So that is face to face. Also accompanying some of the survivors to where they need to go, either it is Salvation Army, because Salvation Army continues to do very good work in providing shelters and, and providing for the people who go there, so accompaniment there. Uh, of course, appearing court appearances we have to do, the lawyers have to do that. Uh, and our police liaison officer, we have one, so he also accompanies the, the lawyers. Um, also now we have recently started and we'll have to because all of a sudden we've got masks and things such a proper mask so we started going to attend to children who have been abused the neighbors are calling and then we are able to do that also so slowly you know as the, the relaxation takes place we will start reviewing what more can we do now um, I understand the work that you do require a multi-sectoral uh, approach can you briefly describe the network that your center um, is involved in and how effective this has been for Fiji Women Crisis Center during this pandemic and also with TC Herald? Well, you see, um, the SDP, the SDP COVID GBV uh, group that I have already talked about, that is very, very useful in this work and really commending the Ministry for Women for leading this and keeping at it. We have a Zoom meeting every week. We have got a Viber group going where we share information and issues and concerns. And you know, a lot of work is being done through that. So that was really worthwhile doing that. Um, and uh, you know, we'll be doing further work on it. Um, and then we also have formed other alliances. We have got the NGO Coalition for Human Rights, you know, monitoring human rights um, uh, violations and how that is going, um, uh, documentation. Uh, we also have formed and, and how we can get things through to people like uh, alliances with friend uh, in the West. 
because they have got a, further, a, a bigger outreach, you know, especially during the lockdown in Lotoka, how to get supplies, medical and food supplies over to them. So all those alliances, and we're calling upon this because these are not just new alliances. These are people we have worked with before, but m in a more intense manner right now. So and then also when we know that uh, Empower Pacific and Medical Services Pacific are going to Lao and Kandavu and so on, then we keep out of that. We keep track of what is happening and attend to phone calls. There also are Empower Pacific is also referring cases to us. So, you know, we so also do uh, a referral to each other. So, you know, so that's how so we don't duplicate, but we complement each other's work. So that is really good that those alliances have been formed. And of course, then we have those alliances, uh, the relationship that we've had with the police force, you know, to having a direct line to the commissioner of police and to all the commanders and so on, the command center. We've got very good women advocates within the police force that we have trained over the years. So, you know, so keeping all those going uh, is also very important. Stay with us, we've got more for you after the break. Welcome back to the show. Now, Shamima, what kind of financial support is available to the Fiji Women Crisis Centre and has this been enough to respond to the need on the ground, especially during this pandemic? Yes, well, the Fiji Women's Crisis Centre has had multi-year funding from the New Zealand and Australian governments. And, you know, as I said, the uh, government uh, na toll free, national toll-free DV helpline uh, we also run, and that is on a budget of an annual budget of 200000 So, unfortunately, this year we didn't get the two hundred; we We've only got 50000 even though the budget has alloc had allocated 200000 for reasons best known to people. So we have enough to run that through to June. And uh, then we have also the New Zealand government that has been very supportive. It funds all our branches and uh, our funding from Australia and New Zealand was going to end this June and we're going to work on a new document, design document for the next number of years, you know, it's a multi-year funding, but that of course is on the back burner now, but New Zealand has come up and you know, extended uh, the contract for another year. Uh, with DFAT, we are still negotiating because the, everything is towards COVID and they really don't know whether there will be funding, bridging funds and so on. But, you know, that doesn't deter us. We have got money that people have over the years given us. We have a trust fund. So we will continue to do that. Some of us, the people who are higher paid, uh, you know, will have to go. We are going on a pay cut uh, very soon. So we will take pay cut and have some savings there. Um, and then we're also applying for other, uh, you know, funding that is available worldwide. So while we're doing all this work, the administrative staff, the researchers, they're doing their work with data collection and all that. But we are also working on proposals, looking at, which is really hard because, you know, to do this work, you still need money. Um, and uh, while, uh, you know, we, you have to pay for phones, you have to pay for a whole lot of stuff and uh, and then also you don't want to because the staff are very hard working you don't want to uh, make them redundant and and their skills are just so much required now so it's a difficult time and we're still negotiating now the good news uh, this week for Fiji as mentioned by the Prime Minister is that we have a recovery rate of 44 percent how much longer do you think the Fiji Women Crisis Center can handle the impact of the pandemic before you are on the resources available for you? Well, uh, you know, at the moment, as I said, uh, we have enough to last us till December, the Fiji Center itself, but we're looking for further thing, uh, further money, and hopefully the government will revert to the, to the normal amount for the toll-free line. And then we will uh, later on, uh, in New Zealand, of course, we have enough to for all our branches in Ba, Nandi, Rakiraki, and Lambasa, which serves all of Vanualevu. Uh, if the, uh, when the contract is extended, we'll be able to last till August 2021. Uh, yeah, to yeah, to sorry, June 2021. And you know, we're hoping that the Suva one will also go to that. If not, then we'll have to start looking at redundancies and asking people to go home and having a small payout and things like that. Yeah. Now, how were you able to coordinate the support that you can provide to the people that need it during this pandemic? Yes, well, that is important. Like, you know, we have 
we have vehicles which we are very lucky we have got some drivers amongst our staff as well as a dedicated driver our police liaison officer also doubles up as the driver he's one of the uh, 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 ones directed to do that so um, you know so the coordination is very good and we keep it up by phone by zoom by viber talking to each other but also talking to other people and we have built good relationships so that when we do call things happen and if they don't happen then we go higher and higher and higher till something does happen you know so i think the coordination a, a, around gbv in this uh, has gone very well and that also is because the crisis center is there you know we are the pioneers in this work for over 35 years there's a lot of credibility there is a lot of experience and there are a lot of experts in this area and you know and other agencies have had followed us and also have that the ministry for women for example you know and then you have got the technical expertise from the un agencies particularly un women so you know we are very well able to coordinate the work now uh, what are some factors triggering the spike in domestic violence during this pandemic uh, you see um look we know that uh, in domestic violence one of the features is social isolation that is where a lot of coercive control, where the woman is not allowed to go out, she's not allowed to meet with people and so on. And so when he's able to do that, she still sometimes has some leeway when he's at work or something to make a quick phone call or to go out and visit a crisis center and things like that. Now, this situation is very different from anything else where there is enforced isolation and social distancing. And we all can't do anything about it. You know, if we want not to get the virus, we have to stick to those. And there is a lot of fear and so on. So when you have things like that, then it becomes worse. And we are seeing almost, you know, almost 40% of the people who are now reporting domestic violence are telling us that either it has started now with pregnant women and so on, the violence, or where there was already violence, it's intensified. So, you know, so it's like the, the very um, conducive situation, that isolation for domestic violence to thrive and any other kind of violence, actually, you know, because a lot of the um, sexual assaults and rape and things are also done by people known to the survivor and a lot of them are relatives. So that also we're already getting calls about children where the, the, the known neighbor has also molested children and things like that, you know. So uh, very, very conducive where people can't go out and they have to stay either in their own communities or in their own homes. Now, uh, how can people or couples help reduce domestic violence cases within their own homes? Very much, very, they can. I mean, you know, it, it, look, domestic violence when it happens because of the patriarchal nature of society. You know, patriarchy is entrenched in our society. And when things like this happen, it gets further entrenched. You know, you've got the security forces on the road, you know, there's a lot of machoism and things like that. So, um, so, it, so it's the men who can control it. So, you know, the, what we can do is we can talk to the men. We are hoping that some of our male advocates will, can be given phones and they will be planning that, that they can then respond to men who are frustrated who want to talk to someone but they can't and then they lash out on the vulnerable and, and, you know, and things like that so we are hoping to do that also so they can do that there are a whole lot of stuff that neighbors and communities and families can do you know you get a text from someone you know saying look i'm in danger you call 1560 you call any one of our lines and we will be there if you get they tell us all those things so you know we all it's a community responsibility we're asking our traditional leaders our turanga nikoros who've gone through our training retired police officers whom we have been working with you know and our um, women advocates who are almost in a, most of the communities around Fiji where we have been that there we're also working on them to be able to report to be able to support and so on so you know so those are the ways in which communities and individuals within the home the extended family they can help out in reducing and prevention what would be your advice to women and men who are, who are perpetrators of violence what will be your advice then during this pandemic? I would say, look, this is a time when we, we're all in this. 
no one is immune to this thing. We can get it if we don't follow all the health rules that, has been, that have been given to us by the Ministry of Health, by the government. Uh, we should follow all of that. And this is the time when we, we don't know when we can lose somebody to this. So this is the time when all the kindness, compassion and everything comes to the fore that we are so famous for. You know, one of the happiest places in the world kind of thing. So I think this is what we need to practice. For the men, I will say, please, so much is in your hands, you know. Uh, you, you, you can do so much. And if you want to talk to someone, please call us. We will do the right referral for you. There's also Lifeline. There's Empower Pacific that you can call. And hopefully we can give you some other numbers. Women, please. You are not alone. There are people who can help you. Sometimes it's impossible to call. Send a text to a family. Send a text to a friend to say you are in danger. And they will get back to us. You know, we're hoping that they will get back. So that's what I'm saying. To children also, there's a message to say it's okay to be scared. You know, we all want to be loving and hugging and kissing our friends and family. But this is not the time. And, you know, and if you need to talk also, the Medical Services Pacific phone line is there. 1325, that's toll free. You can also call and talk. Thank you so much, uh, Shamima, for that. And thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. Pleasure. And that was your close-up show for this week. For feedbacks or comments, please feel free to contact us on 3305100 or simply drop us an email at news at fijitv.com.fg. Thank you so much for your company. I sure do appreciate your time. From the team and I, do have a productive week ahead. Stay safe, stay home, and good night.